Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the mic moments. Now, here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Today, my guest is Patrick Willis. Patrick is seen the turmoil of loved ones coping with life-threatening illness. Patrick realized that the medical system rarely equips them for the mental battle. Seeing this, Patrick designed a program to help those diagnosed with life-limiting illnesses live their best possible life. This pioneers a unique approach covering everything needed to complement medicine from mindset shifts to household checklists to leaving the best legacy. Patrick saw that much of the work he was doing was preparation needed by everyone. So he developed resources to enable anyone to get prepared to protect their family if the worst happened. Patrick became a business owner in 2016, finally escaping the corporate greasy pole. He is the father of five beautiful children, a leader in the local church, and a folk and jazz musician, among other things. Welcome to the show, Patrick. It is a pleasure having you here, all the way from the United Kingdom. Thank you, Art. Thank you. That's great. Yes, I'm really glad to be here. It has been near and dear to my heart what you do, because in 2006, I lost my wife of 38 years, and I will tell you, nothing prepared me. Even though I knew her diagnosis of ovarian cancer was going to be terminal, I kept saying to myself, you know, I'm prepared. I'm going to prepare myself. I'm going to get through this. But the night that she died in my arms, I learned I was not prepared. No, but that's a gut punch a hundred times over, isn't it? Oh boy, it is. It is. So can you tell us your story, how how this all worked out? I will, yeah. I mean, in some ways, I'm not a kind of likely character to be doing this. I, I'm really not. It's interesting. I mean, I'm I'm a techie and I'm an engineer by background. So I don't come from the caring professions and I don't have a, a kind of a medical degree or a therapy degree. I've done lots of therapy studies since. So I wasn't expecting to be doing this. It's funny how life does that to you sometimes, isn't it? It really is. Oh, it is. It's amazing how things just, when you follow the path that life sends us down and you don't miss a turn in it, you keep exploring everything with the possibilities of it, then everything becomes possible. Yeah. Essentially, I just did what a lot of people do. You know, you study, you go to college, you get a good job. And, you know, I was an engineer for years. I worked in IT. I ended up running very large systems and projects. You know, the ones you kind of hear about in the news that lose millions and millions of dollars, those those sort of projects. I did a lot of those sort of projects. But I was pretty good at the whole corporate drone thing and, and climbing the pole and, and whatnot. And finally got an opportunity to break out of it. And it took me a long time, I think, because again, as you mentioned, I had five kids and suddenly you've got all this these dependents who kind of rely on your income. And so breaking out of that was something I really wasn't prepared to take the risk of doing. And now they're kind of all grown up. It was probably, you know, again, about five years ago now where I started thinking, okay, I need to get out of this. (laughs) And so I did. I got some opportunities to get a bit of surplus income-wise together and then stop what I was doing and have a good look around. And it took me a while actually to find it because I thought, okay, I'd like a lifestyle kind of job now where I can have my laptop and work from anywhere and all the marketing gurus tell you to still follow them by three steps and it just happens isn't it well you know what it's not quite as easy as that is it as we all find out when we actually try and do it and I thought I'd use my technical skills and whatever but it really wasn't very satisfying I was making progress but I thought well I'm not that passionate about this and you know one day and this was one day and it was back in as I said I mentioned it was not that long ago it was three four years ago now and I was I was walking along near where I live and you know, I go out there, I'd pray and meditate and think, you know, and sunshines, walk around my village. And this idea drops in my head about supporting people at end of life. And it just kind of dropped. And I thought, where did that come from? And I- <laughs> that's what I call an epiphany. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. When it comes out of, from above and down on you, that's an epiphany. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry, Matt, it wasn't the shower. I'm so sorry about that. I was I was walking by a little stream near, near my, near my house. It wasn't in the shower. I, mean, I could have fallen in the stream at that point, I tell you. And I thought, that's so crazy. And I was convinced, I'll tell you now, I mean, I, so I'm a Christian. I believe in a higher power. And 
I thought, there's no way I could have thought that up on my own. I would never have seen myself doing that. So I thought, okay, what are we going to do? So I thought, well, okay, yes, I had had some brushes with death. So my wife had stage three cancer. It was back in 2000, 2006, 2007. Thankfully, she she recovered and she's she's still alive now, which is great. I've seen both my parents through end of life issues, and so I wasn't unfamiliar with it. But it was just this strange prodding. I had to go do something with it. So I thought, what shall I do? I know. So I started volunteering in a, in a local hospice and, and offering counselling to people at end of life as they're going in there as a, a spiritual support person because I was through the church, looks of my church, and I found out that I actually was quite good at it, and it didn't. Bother me, you know, you talk to some people, Art. Some people you talk to and they'll go, well, that's great. And other people go, how how the heck could you do that, man? <laughs> and I found out that I could. Well, that's a gift. That's a gift. Yeah, and it, I really felt like that. It really did. I never would have seen myself doing it. But then I thought, okay, great. I could do this. What's next? So then I thought, well, I've got coaching skills. I know how to coach. Let's fill in the gaps that I've got around specific end of life issues and so I started to fill those in and took additional training so I felt comfortable to support people coaching them specifically around things that will come up around end of life and the reality is art and you'll know this you'll know this I cannot say I know how you feel because I don't I'm not you and I can't say that <laughs> mm-hmm. but what I can do is I can see yeah people in your situation commonly have these kind of issues they'd like to work through. And that's what I do. And then, as you mentioned in my bio, a lot of the preparation stuff is for all of us. And we're not smart if we don't do it, especially if we have dependents, any children or partners and so forth. That is true. I mean, you know, personally speaking, I know that after my wife passed away for about, and I'm not joking, six months, everything was a blur. You know, I cannot tell you who was at my wife's funeral. I have no clue because I was so fogged out. You know, with that, unless you've experienced it, it, there's no way to describe it. The emptiness, the abandonment. I mean, you go through so many different emotions when you lose somebody. The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good, helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. Tell us what can you kind of give us just a synopsis of some of the things that you go through to help people prepare? Yeah, I, I will do. I mean, there's two sides to this art. There's the side that applies to somebody who kind of knows they're facing the end of life, and then the kind of the rest of us. And so there's just two different parts of that puzzle. So if I do what applies to all of us, perhaps that's the you know, an easy one in a way, what we all need to do. Yeah, because one of the questions I had for you is I've had friends, and well, when I was in Vietnam in the Marines, when you lose somebody unexpectedly, it's totally different than when you lose somebody that you know has got an illness or anything. But like car accidents and war and and any of those things, you know, I mean, it could be a slip on the sidewalk. I mean, you know, and you can hit your head and and pass away, you know, so. I tell my story to people. I I hear that more and more. They'll pretty much everybody knows somebody who's died unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everybody knows somebody who's been in that position. How do you prepare for the unexpected? I write about it in my book. And you know how I describe preparing for the unexpected is you have to prep yourself. You always have to have in the back of your mind in this tucked away space that if this happens, this happens, this is what I do. This is what how I go. And I know it sounds morbid and weird, but if you don't do it, when you have something unexpected happen, you're totally unprepared and you're lost. Yeah. Let's take the easy one first. Let's deal with some of the the practical things, if you like, because 
frankly, if you get those nailed, as you said, if you're in that situation, your head's all over the place. You don't know what's going on. So you're not thinking about paying the bills. You're not thinking about, you know, contacting people. So if you get that stuff nailed, it's just going to make the, the difficult stuff a little bit easier. So there are four parts to that. There's what you might ever would think of as estate planning. So having a will, having a power of attorney, insurance, all that financial stuff, which some people have got. A lot of people know they should have and they don't. But that's, that's wonders, estate planning. Then there's all the practical stuff. How many passwords have you got for websites? <laughs> At the last count, I had about 350. <laughs> What if your partner, if you die, what if they need to get in there? What if they need to get into your bank account? What if they need to get you know, to pay the bills? All that stuff. Just simple stuff of running the household and having the documents in place and access to assets. So maybe you've got a lot of photographs online. You know, people want to, you know, you wouldn't want to lose those because someone doesn't know about them. Maybe you've got, you know, your Bitcoin wallet if you're a cryptocurrency dude, mm -hmm. or you've got coins under the sofa, you know, who knows? But there's that practical stuff of that, just that list of, Here's stuff you need to know that I've been managing. <laughs> and then there's the personal stuff about you. So your health and well-being, like what you might, got, might know as a healthcare directive or a power of attorney. And that stuff causes so much family pain if somebody is unexpectedly comes in a coma or, or is unable to make decisions themselves. That causes so much grief in families if wishes aren't clear. So much grief. Yeah, and not only do you have to have this stuff available, but you also have to keep it current because life changes all the time. And, you know, you add password, you know, and you deduct people out of your life that you don't want in there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> there is all kinds of stuff, scenarios that go on. So you've got to keep it all current. You do. Yeah. I mean, it's good to look at the stuff once a year, but as a minimum, you want to look at stuff whenever there's a major life event, some kind of happens, you know, maybe you want to, birth of a child or someone leaves home or you have a you know, marriage, divorce, whatever, some major life event is a trigger to go and just review all this mm -hmm. stuff once you've got it set up. But getting it set up in the first place is kind of 80% of the battle done. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's good. And a lot of this is actually about the conversations around it as well. So you may well have written down somewhere, you know, well, I want this to happen to me and I want that and I don't want this kind of treatment or whatever. But if you haven't talked to somebody about it, you're either a power of attorney if you've got one or your partner if, if they will be the next of kin. If they don't know your wishes and understand them really well, then it's not enough. So it's the, it's the conversation and the documentation that have to go together, Art. Mm -hmm. Have you created a format for this? Yeah, I do. I do. Unsurprisingly, I do. Now, this is... <laughs> you know how you, let me, you know let how me, we get... <laughs> let me ask a funny question here. <laughs> Did your engineering background come into play with the development of this? Oh, guess what it did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Because I happen to know that engineers are highly structured people <laughs> and highly methodical. <laughs> so I could only assume that. You found me out, man. You, you found me <laughs> out. That's true. But you know what? Engineers can be slow in getting stuff right as well. And so it's very much a work in progress. When I work one-on-one -on -one with people, I take them through it. But I'm trying to get a whole course in the can at the moment. And, it, and it's not quite in the can. I'm, it's a work in progress, but it's not quite in the can yet. So one-on-one, -on -one I'm ready to do. I do with people. But the other, I want to have a, an on, a completely online version going so people can work through it in their own time. And then give me a drop me a line if they've got a problem in email and so forth, but mostly do it in their own pace. But that's still a work in progress. <laughs> it should be done by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's not like you uh, with five kids and, <laughs> and a wife and everything that, that you don't have other things that occupy your time. And no all. distractions at all. Absolutely none. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, I test some of this stuff with my wife as well. I was sat in the car with her a little while ago, and I've got a new little kind of a handout tool, which is to a bunch of like, would I want this type of treatment questions? And there's like 10 questions in there. And I, I, this is a freebie on the website as well. I was welcome to take it. But the idea is, is that you answer the questions for yourself and then you answer the questions for the other person, and how you think they would respond. And then you kind of swap and see if you've got each other right. Wow. <laughs> which is a really simple but effective way of... So, so my wife gets the stuff tested on her, you know. <laughs> she doesn't seem to mind. 
Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. My wife spent one day in hospice, and that was because my wife's wish was that she'd come home to our ranch and that she die at home. Yeah. And the doctor convinced me that she needed to go to hospice. And I sent her to hospice for the one day, and it was not a good experience for us here. Because of my wife's progression of her illness, she had a C. diff infection, which is highly contagious. Yeah. And they isolated her. And literally, I called her nurse Gestapo. (laughs) Oh, man. Would not let us. I mean, this was going to be supposedly her last day on earth. And they wouldn't let us go in as a family. And there was just a whole bunch of things. So I called our doctor and I said, I don't like this and I want to take her home. And literally our doctor said, Art, pick her up in your arms, (laughs) pick her up in your arms, put her in the car, drive her to the ranch and we'll deal with it. I literally picked her up, put her in the car and drove her to the ranch, got her into bed at home and, of course, hospice wanted to come to the house now yeah, because they need to, there was a lot of medications and narcotics and stuff that she was on and all that. Her twin sister was there and her little sister were there and both are nurses. So all three of the girls were nurses. So to caring for her that last final days, but they said that she would pass that day and literally she stayed alive for several days afterwards. But I know from being at the hospice center, I would be too emotional to be effective. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Because it's got to be emotional for you when you see somebody, you know, I know it's different when it's someone you love, but you know, I guess my thing is, is that I love everybody. (laughs) Yeah. So obviously a nice guy, aren't you? So obviously (laughs) are. Can I just recognize what you said there? How wonderful in a way, though, that you were able to take her home and have the family around in those last days. I mean, that that is priceless. Yeah. And priceless. And I let other people and, you know, this was part of my epiphany with expectations. You know, when you let other people's expectations dictate to you what you do. Mm. And you know in your gut that something's not right, and you know you made the wrong decision. It became very evident to me the minute that they took her out of the hospital and put her into the hospice facility that I had made the wrong decision. Yeah. I had to make it right. So doing the right thing is you know it in your gut. Uh, It's great you're able to do that. I mean, the trauma some people go through with people dying in intensive care in a hospital with a million medics around them trying mm-hmm. to give them a few more minutes of life that isn't helpful to anybody yeah. so uh, that's wonderful you were able to do that for her well thank you how amazing yeah she gave me 38 years of undivided love and attention if i couldn't take care of her the last three years of her life i wouldn't be much of a man wow wow so i dropped everything i dropped everything my business everything to take care of her you know i never missed a chemo treatment Never, never missed the doctor's appointment, you know, so it was a blessing. Yeah, that is priceless. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So your question, sorry, is this, how do I, I mean, I think, you know, we're all wired a bit differently, aren't we? We're all wired a bit differently. And and I'm, I'm wired with relatively low, low levels of of, of emotional movement, which means like I can function that way. And I, I can, I know a lot of people would get too personally engaged with all of them. And, and I know it doesn't get to me because it does. There was one time when I, I went back into the uh, the hospice after a, a weekend and found that four of the people that I counseled and spoken to the previous week had all died over the weekend. And man, that was tough. Oh, yeah. That was tough to take. 
But generally speaking, I've got the kind of makeup that means that I can absorb it and move on. Plus, as well, I find that a lot of the coaching techniques that I use, use help people with in terms of like just doing something simple, like, you know, some mindfulness and dropping an anchor to to steady yourself in the emotional storm. Doesn't let the storm go away. It just means you could ride the waves a little. I use that on myself. So I used to uh, try, try very much practice what I preach too. Do you think that you have a high degree of emotional intelligence? I never used to have. I was a nerdy engineer, man. I had no emotional intelligence at all. I had to learn it from scratch. Absolute zero. I once bought a book, right, called how to talk to anyone, you know, like parties and so forth. My wife stopped it to me and she looked at the book and said, what do you do that for? It's all obvious. I said, no, 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 not obvious to me. I have no idea. I don't do this social interaction stuff. So really from my, my late teens, early 20s, I had to ex- deliberately train myself to, to raise my level of emotional intelligence until I could function as a healthy member of society. <laughs> 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 but the fact it's so deliberate for me, in some ways, made it easier because I'm very much more aware of the processes that are going on in my own head. Yeah, you know, when we were talking, I was thinking about, you know, I don't wouldn't have as much problem talking to somebody who is actually dying, the actual person who's dying. You know what would get me the family because I know what the loneliness and the abandonment and the feelings that they're going to go through afterwards. And people aren't prepared for that, you know? No. And how do you prepare them for what's going to happen? I mean, how do you coach them through that? I mean, you're quite right. More often than not, I found that a person who's dying comes to terms with their own situation far more rapidly than their family does. Mm -hmm. Far more rapidly. And so one of the things I very much encourage the family to do is to listen to the person because they just all the time, it's like they're guilty for stuff they haven't done in the past. They're already anticipating guilt for things they won't do in the future. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I encourage them to listen to the person, listen to their loved one and say, well, you know, just hear what they want because actually they're pretty settled about this. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was true for you, but I've certainly found that there's that people when they, they recognize and actually get a level of acceptance about what's happening rather than just fighting it all the time. You know, fight, fight, fight for an extra minute of life rather than embrace what's there now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, this is, I've mentioned this on the show before to my audience, but one of the greatest gifts my wife left me was just before she passed away, she said to me, she said, I want to give you a gift. And I looked at her and said, what possibly can you give me? She turned around and said to me, I want to release you from your marriage vows. Wow. So you can go find somebody who needs you as much as I have needed and loved you. And I didn't realize it at the time. What a tremendous person it took. That's huge. To release your husband of 38 years to go find someone else because she knew. And I didn't realize it till three years later when I started dating. And I started dating guilt-free because I had her permission. Yep. That's huge. If I hadn't had her permission, I wouldn't have been able to date. And the, the dating was, we could go, we could do a whole thing at, <laughs> about a 60-year-old man or 63-year-old man at the time dating because that was a whole other thing but I couldn't have done it had she done what she did. It was such a gift and such a blessing. Yeah, that is a huge gift. And the strength it took for her to do that. Incredible. So do you have any instances like that where you hear people just do other incredible things that, you know, when people are are dying? I think it's just an example. It was, again, it's so often the people who are dying who are looking after (laughs) their loved ones rather than the other way around. And that is just... Just, just so common. I went in with a uh, chap a little while ago, and he had two or three of his friends there. And I kind of came in, and he says, oh, it's great to see you, he says, but we're just chilling here. We're not having any serious conversations. We've just been chill. We're just shooting the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he was just trying to help his friends reach the point of acceptance that he'd reached. 
about his life. Yeah, and that that word acceptance mm. is so easy to say, but so difficult to accomplish, and particularly under the circumstances. You know, when somebody's at their end, you know, at their end. Yeah. My experience has been so varied because of Vietnam when I was a yeah. Marine and seeing guys go. Wow. You know, and it's just, it's rapid and they're gone. Sometimes it's not even a, a full step. It's a half step and they're gone. It just gives you a whole different perspective on life. You know, that you can be here one minute and gone the next. But, you know, I want to get back to the preparation for dying. You know, we kind of got off the subject. We had done, <laughs> we had done, I think you said there was three parts of preparing. Oh. Or, yeah, we did kind of three or the four, I think. Uh, we do talked about estates and practicals and personal healthcare stuff. Mm-hmm. And there's also the last wishes thing about, you know, funeral and messages and any unfinished business you've got. Like people you need to forgive. <laughs> people you, you want to offer forgiveness to and receive from. People you want to say thank you to. Just some simple unfinished business that a lot of us carry around for a lot of years. And I think when you said perspective art, again, it's one of those huge things that you don't realize until you see it, is it, where Mm -hmm. recognizing that you are mortal, you are not living forever, at whatever age you have to do that, whether it's 20, 60, 80, and recognizing that, recognizing you are mortal, changes your perspective in terms of what's actually important and what things you should hang on to. Should you hang on to that? argument or that grudge should you focus all the effort worrying about something that is not going to matter in a year's time so that perspective and again what i i really desire to see as people go through a process with me of planning and preparing even if they're nowhere near dying if they're perfectly healthy just want to get through things and be organized is a fresh perspective on you know what yeah i ain't gonna live forever and this stuff here now That worry, it does not matter. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. Is it more important to prepare before you get ill? I mean, I'm I'm, I'm answering my own question. (laughs) Is it more important to prepare before than when you get ill? You know? The stuff you need to do. There really is stuff you need to do. So if you have a child and you don't have a will, you're saying to the state, please do what you'd like of my child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> that's the, <laughs> so you don't have a will. You say to the state, please do what you like with my money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, things like if you're the bill payer and you're incapacitated, for whatever reason, the last thing you or your family want is people knocking at your door, wanting to take your stuff away because you didn't know where the money was or you didn't about this bill that had to be paid just simple practical stuff that with a few simple steps and a little bit of discipline a little bit of planning you could take off the table yeah you know what are some of the biggest problems people don't expect when they have a terminal illness oh that's a that's that's a question (laughs) (laughs) i think one of them is actually how weird their friends can be one thing that just happens again and again is that some people who you thought were really good friends kind of disappear because they just can't cope. They just cannot cope. They do not how they don't know how to deal with you without being totally weird. And so they back off. But then other people who you kind of thought you didn't know very well, they get drawn in. And so you kind of find your friendship group shifts. <laughs> it kind of shifts to actually the, to the right group of people because it's the people you need to then. And I talk about some of my work, how you organize your friends. You kind of get a friend who's a friend you take to the doctors with you, a friend you just chill out and go shopping with, you know, a friend you could unload to, you know, a friend who'll answer the door for you. So you have a little, a little gang who you work organize around you. But it's amazing how people's friendships shift because of other people's issues with thinking about end of life. You know, one of the biggest things that I remember after my wife's funeral One of the biggest things that I remember is at church, when we had the church service, they put on a big dinner. All the people in our little community came, village came and put on a a luncheon kind of thing. And we had that. After that, they loaded my car with a ton of food. They loaded my car with a ton of flowers and they set me down the road. 
and I was alone mm. for weeks and no one except my children. People that I had been close to and people that she had been close to because her sisters lived far away. They actually got on planes right after her funeral and flew back to their families because they had spent the last few days there and they had to get back. But I remember the loneliness after the service and they loaded up my car and the food in there. I threw more food out. A person could eat in a, six months. I mean, mm. but I tell people, and one of the things I'm sure you do is keep in contact after the funeral, keep in contact because it is extremely important because yep. that's when you are the loneliest and you feel alone. Now, people don't stay in contact because they don't know what to say or Same. what to do. But sometimes it's just a matter of being there. And yeah, and everyone think, oh, do I say I'm sorry? I don't know. It doesn't sound right. And you go, no, it's actually okay to go, you know what? That is a complete pile of you're in now. Uh, <laughs> but let me let me sit there with you. <laughs> let, yeah. let, let, me, let, let me let me be there with you. Isn't it? That's all I would have ever asked is just yeah. somebody to be there. After a while, you know, there was a few people that came around and all that, but the vast majority I still have not have contact with. Because you know? uh, again, people don't know. I mean, you probably heard this one, which is probably one of the most horrible things you could say is, so uh, are you not over it yet? <laughs> yeah. Excuse me while I punch your lights out. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The wound may heal, but the scar will never go away. Yeah. And that's something to rejoice about. That's a part of your life that was always part of your life. And it's going to be part of your life. And that's okay. And it still hurts because it was such a big, such a big loss. Well, I still get emotional. I mean, yeah. as you've heard on yeah. the show, I mean, I still yeah. sh shed tears and I'm remarried. But you know, one of the biggest things I wanted to ask you, and it's another one of my oddball questions, but, you know, I went three years of, well, I went two and a half years of not dating, three years pretty close. And then I started dating. And then it was a hub love of, <laughs> of experiences and all that. <laughs> But when I found Beverly, my current wife, I knew that she was the blessing that Vicki had talked to me about, that she was the one. She had never been married. She was 53 years old. I was 63. And she had never had children. You know, she has been such a blessing to my children's lives and all that. And I don't know if you ever get this much of a chance to talk about to families that have lost or young men that have lost spouses. but. I want them to know that there is a life after death. There is. There is another life out there. I just had a very, very dear friend who I worked with with counseling because she met a gentleman who had lost his entire family in a flood, and he lost his two young children and his wife, and they started dating. And, uh, you know, her expectations of what to expect, we kind of went through a lot of it. And there's a transition period that we all go through and you have to let people grieve and you have to let them get through that transition period. But my words to them is you will come out whole on the other side. If you'll let yourself grieve and, and follow the process. That's it. If you let yourself, that's absolutely it. You just, you just have to let flow. Mm -hmm. Don't try and push it away. You're fighting a losing battle. You can't just let it, let it flow. Yeah. You have to, you have to deal with it. You know, you have to, you have to process it. Yeah. That's the word. Yep. You have to process it and, and normalize it because you never forget, you never forget your spouse, you know, or your loved ones, you know, you never forget your mom and dad, but you learn to live with it and you learn to have process how you deal with it. That back to the point you were saying before about some of the biggest problems people don't expect if they get a life limited diagnosis of some sort is that everyone thinks about the medical stuff, don't they? And the thing I mentioned the friends, I think about the medical stuff, but it's all the emotional stuff. You mentioned the guilt. It's like, yeah, they're guilty of what they're going to leave their partner. They're guilty for the healthy choices that they haven't made or angry because they made healthy choices that didn't work out or annoyed and frustrated about this. is endless reel of emotions that just plays through. And like you said there, you have to process it. You can't push it away. You just have to ride out the storm a little and let the storm ride out. And it's all different for each one of us, don't you think? Yeah. It's very, very different for each one of us how we deal with it because we've had different experiences with our spouse 
or our loved one, however you want to phrase it. Don't know which direction you want your life to take? Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So, what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. You know, I, I just think about the processing part of it and how different it really is. But yet there's so many things about it that are the same. And that's what you prepare us for because you prepare us for the for the commonality that comes with with death. Yep. Preparing all the documents and preparing all that and the mental the mental preparedness. What are some of the myths that you've come across? <laughs> come across the value of death. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you one of my favorites, really. And it's stupid when you say it, but people think it. If I talk about dying, it somehow makes it more likely to happen. <laughs> yeah. If I prepare properly, then I'm kind of wishing it on myself. Now, when you say it, it sounds stupid, doesn't it? But I think that's kind of what goes on in a lot of people's heads behind behind it all. Well, coming from the field that we do, yeah. you know, and thinking about, you know, hey, we are what we think we are and we are what we, we process. It, yeah. it kind of feeds right into it. But, you know, I, I never have thought of it that way. But if people don't like to talk about it because uh, and think about it because there's a kind of almost like brings it on a bit. Oh, well, you know, I don't want to, you know, don't talk that way. Don't talk about if you might die. Because, But no, actually, I need to prepare this stuff. You know, that's good to prepare this stuff. And another another big one, I think, for me is, is that if you are ill, then thinking quality of life is all about the medical treatment. Because quality of life is about what's going on in your head. Mm-hmm. And it is the quality of life is everyone gets caught up in, yeah, I need this treatment, I need that treatment. And, and the medical staff are telling you this and that. And will I get slightly better quality of this or with that? But the real damage to your life quality is the fear and the worry and the numbness and the anxiety that's ripping through your body. And if you can deal with that, then your life quality goes up a whole bunch of notches. And I think so people just to reset that life quality is far more about what's going on in your head than what's going on in your body. Mm -hmm. What role does heaven play? People's belief in heaven. You know what? I'm going to be a little controversial here, Art. Okay. (laughs) I said to you what, I'm a Christian. I'm a leader in in a church. And I often find, and shoot me down here, that a lot of people of faith are far too concerned about hanging on to their life now than some heavenly future. And they are almost <laughs> obsessed with divine healing and divine intervention, which does happen, mm-hmm. but it's not as common as we would like it to be, I suspect. And then they are about heaven. So I think if they would reset their thinking about, yeah, actually, my life now is a small drop in the ocean compared to an eternity, mm-hmm. they would be great. But I think people's theory on that and their practice – don't always line up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a book, and it's called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Oh, I've not read that. I'll just look that up. It is a very, very interesting book. It was given to us by our pastor when Vicki was diagnosed. And I don't want to say when she was diagnosed, when she was re-diagnosed and, and terminal. Hmm. He gave us the book, and it's a very intricately written synopsis of heaven from a biblical standpoint. And it's really difficult read. You really, I mean, I was going back and forth between Bibles, books, and dictionaries trying to put it all together. And, you know, and Vicki and I read it together. So we had that pleasure. I mean, there ain't a lot in the Old Testament about heaven at all, is there? (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, after she read that, her peace, she came to a peace. That is brilliant. Yeah. And 
let me tell you one of the things about the book that was so interesting for us is the myths about heaven are so incredibly skewed <laughs> to how society wants to see it and are not biblically factual. Mm -hmm. And Randy Alcorn points out the biblical, there's a word I'm looking for. Perspective? Controversy. Yeah. You know, and the biblical reality, mm. you know, because of the myths that we're told, you know, that we're going to meet our, you know, we're going to meet our maker. We're going to meet our, our spouses. We're going to meet our friends. We're going to see our puppy, you know, I mean, we're <laughs> going to have all these things that come through us. And then you have the people who have had the near death experiences and tell you all this stuff. Oh yeah. Biblically that's BS. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> And he goes into the detail biblically with the references and everything of why it is not. And that's what heaven is about. That's really neat. And it really, I'm going to encourage you to read it. Mm. It's a difficult read. And you'll probably call me and say, why did you do this to me? No, <laughs> no, no, I will definitely read it. I mean, it's interesting, really, because in my work, I don't have any expectations of the spirituality of my clients, mm -hmm. if you like, because... I don't want that to be a barrier for anybody. And I'm happy to have any kind of conversation they want, but I don't want that to be a barrier either. Yeah. So I tend not to focus overly on it. But I, if someone has a spirituality, then I think it's very much mm -hmm. something we should be part of their, of their process. Yeah. You know, now that we've gone through all this, I had this thought in my head about, you know, something you had said about when people asked you what you do, how do you tell them what you do? <laughs> yeah, I kind of come with a new sentence every time, I think. But generally speaking, I start off by saying I support people at end of life and I help those who are who have a kind of terminal illness to live live their best possible life now. What's people's reaction? It is fifth, it is down the middle. It's like, do you have marmite in the States or Vegemite or something? It's one of those foods that you either love it or you hate it. There is no in between. And you kind of get like kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's one of those things that either they go, wow, that's amazing. How have you told me all right? Or they go, that's really weird. And they start just slowly stepping backwards away from you. There is no halfway house here. <laughs> See, I would find that interesting. It says a lot about the person mm. and their worldview of death. Yeah. You know, it really does. I think we see so little of death in the Western world now because it's, it's now, I mean, 100 years ago, everybody had people die at home and like you did, it was normal. So from a child, you'd see old relatives die. You'd understand what the process would like. And death wouldn't be scary and horrible. It would just be kind of part of life. We've sanitized it and we've pushed it over to some little corner that we don't try not to think about. And that's what people struggle with, I think. Are you afraid of death? Me, no. Me neither. No. I don't fear it. I mean, I've seen it and I've seen what it does. And I focus more on living for the now and yeah. the moment than I do about dying because we never know. I mean, I've learned that we never know. You know, when you were talking about people that are healthy and stuff, my late wife never drank, never smoked, ate well had a beautiful body. She was never more than 110 pounds. I mean, on a five foot, three and a half frame, she just took care of herself. And boom, she gets cancer. We have no. My wife, just the same, says, "How I'm so annoyed. You know, I've looked after myself, so I'm so annoyed. <laughs> and that was like, you know, I've done all the right lifestyle choices, but there's no guarantees. There's never a guarantee. Yeah, and there is not a guarantee. That is a great way to maybe segment out of this. And I want to give you some time where you can tell people where to get a hold of you, how to get a hold of you, any parting thoughts that you have. Okay. Well, so my website's unfinishedbusiness.life, just unfinishedbusiness.life rather than .com. It's .life. You can go there, top of the homepage, put the two things I do. You can pick the one you're interested in. It's either... Yeah, I, I am actually coping with terminal illness now, or I'm smart and I want to prepare. <laughs> and you pick the option and there's, there's some freebies you can download and there's instructions on how to book a slot if you'd like to speak. So that's, that's very easy to do that. Um, passing thoughts. 
I think I'd want to come back to acceptance and say, when we get to a point of accepting, we realize that the life we have today is a gift. We're thankful for the gift we have today. And we just accept each day as it comes to us. Our quality of life will just go up. Those are powerful words. I mean, powerful thoughts. And Patrick, I'm going to tell you, this has been an honor and a pleasure to share and have you give me and my audience this gift. And I'm going to encourage everybody to go to Patrick's website and pick and choose what, you know, hopefully you're doing this before you get ill. But if you have a family member, I'm going to encourage you to do that. You know, go to his website, seek out his help. Can't tell you enough, Patrick, how blessed I've been through this. And with that being said, I'm going to sign off for day and I'm going to let Heather White take us out of here and end the show on a note of live every day to the best of your ability and make it the happiest day of your life. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.